First Baptist Charlestown, we exist to see the hope of Jesus Christ transform Charlestown by providing every person with an opportunity to hear and respond to the good news of Jesus and equipping them to grow up into maturity in Christ. We seek to accomplish this through authentic worship, shown through worshiping together as a church family. Transparent community, shown through community groups where we live out the one another's. Intentional discipleship, shown through discipleship groups where we train disciples to be disciple makers. And living on mission, by using our gifts to serve in ministry and taking the gospel to where we live, work, and play. If you have any questions about our mission or vision, ask a pastor, fill out a connect card, or scan the QR code found in the bulletin. First Baptist, how are you all? It is joyful to be in the Father's house this morning. That was a word from our associate pastor, Nathaniel, who is not here this morning, so we will keep him in prayer as they are at home with family. Um, but it is good to be here this Father's Day Sunday. Um, as we just get to sing praises and, and bring honor and glory to our Father, who is uh, many things to us. If you, if you had to think of one thing, what, what is the Heavenly Father to you? You, don't, you can shout it out if you want. You don't have to. Redeemer, protector, guider, uh, teacher, so many things we could think of. And I'm thankful for the fathers that we have in, in our sanctuary today that uh, fill so many of those or, or have uh, examples of those as well. But uh, I'm excited to sing with you all this morning. Let's stand and offer our praises to our Father. In the wayside, lost down a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in, crying in the rain. Then I saw lightly from heaven. church. Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Yes, I do. Nothing can separate. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. 
I hope you know this morning that you are a child of love. You're a child of God, and, and that's why we're here singing this morning and praising him. Let's continue in song. Again, we are so glad that um, you all made it here for worship this morning and um, on a special day as it's Father's Day. Um, we know that it's not by accident that we're all here, and we're just praying that um, God moves in the ways that only he can move. If you're a visitor with us or if you've been here 
your whole entire life, we have connection cards that we would love for you to fill out. Um, and if you are a first-time visitor, we would love to, for you to head to the Connection Center after service, and we have a special gift for you. Um, someone will be out there um, to greet you for that. Um, we also have special gifts for dads today since it is Father's Day, so we have these nice tumblers. They're out in the lobby. Um, so if you didn't grab one on the way in, be sure you grab one on the way out. Um, they look pretty great and colorful and have good words on them. So um, we do have some special gifts for some extra special dads this, this morning. Um, so we're going to have a little friendly competition here. Um, if I can have my friends come join me. Also, I'd like to announce that we did, unfortunately, forget Evan's birthday in the bulletin. Um, but please keep in mind that Evan's birthday is June 21st. Um, and he accepts cash at Venmo, Apple Pay. <laughs> All right. So the first uh, special dad that we're going to recognize this morning is the oldest dad. So if um, you think you might be in that age category, go ahead and stand up. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to stand up. Maybe we should stay seated. How old are you? Hi. How old? Hi. How old are you? I'm 99. 99? <laughs> Say less. Say less. Say less. That's incredible. Happy Father's Day. Thank you so much for being with us on your 99th year this Father's Day. Thank you. 99. My word. All right. Next we have... The dad with the most kids present. So um, who showed up today for your dad? Most kids. Let's say like maybe like four or more. Anybody have like four kids here? Jerry Rutherford? Yeah. The man of the hour. <laughs> now we're going to recognize the dad with the youngest child here. Anybody? How about like a one-year-old or a less than one-year-old? <laughs> I'm just like looking at Jake. I'm just waiting for him to stand up. <laughs> hey, there he is! <laughs> and last but not least, how about the, d the dad who's been married the longest? I don't even know where to start. How about 50 years? How about 50 years? Stand up. Oh, 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 dear. How about 55 years? How about, how about, how about 60 years? There he is. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. All right. Is that everything? Did I get it all? All right, let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you um, for giving us um, earthly fathers um, who stand in the gap um, while we're here. And we thank you for um, dads who show up, God, and that we just pray <laughs> that... Um, Throughout this year, God, that um, specifically that we would just have fathers, even in our own church, that would be um, strong leaders and just um, love you so much. And that would just trickle down to their families and that um, they would just be growing and um, knowing you so much more every single day. And um, God, I just pray today for uh, people who don't have dads here, Lord, and we just thank you so much that um, you are our ultimate heavenly father and that you come alongside us. Um, and offer comfort um, and satisfy every every need, um, even when we don't have um, godly examples for dads, even on this earth. Um, and we would just pray that we would just continue um, as a church to um, grow dads and um, help them in their spiritual health as well. In your name, I pray. Amen. If you would please stand again with. Um, just want to invite you at this time also that the altar is open. If uh, you have a gospel conversation that you were sharing with someone, uh, just pray that they would come to know the Father.
How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He would give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin Upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom, His wounds have paid my ransom. Worship you. 
morning we talked about in our community group just uh, things that we had prayed for that God had answered those prayers in the timing of that. And um, I know that that God's still working on me daily. Uh, there's there's times that I mess up or uh, I do things that I shouldn't. Um, but I'm thankful that He's not done working yet. And just as uh, the ping pong balls, the gospel conversations that we were praying for. We know that God is still moving. God is still working. And uh, he's not done yet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we're thankful, Lord, that uh, you are a way maker for so many things, Lord. We know that you are continuing to work on hearts, Lord. You're working on my heart, Lord, for your glory, for your praise, for your honor. And Lord, I pray that I would just shine your light before men, Lord, that they would see you, Lord, and not myself, not, not any individual but Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for the Father that you are to us. You're nurturing, you're guiding, you're loving. Lord, and I'm thankful that we have you in our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us all today, Lord. Let us learn and grow from your word. Let it not sit dormant on our heart, Lord. Let us share your love with those around us as you have called us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Hey, at this time, we're going to dismiss our kids and volunteers for Kids Connection. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say a happy Father's Day. As well to everyone out there this morning, all the dads. Uh, so thankful for godly dads um, and those who have stepped up to be fathers uh, when they didn't have to be. And uh, we just praise God for that. It's so cool, Ed, uh, to have a dad here worshiping that's 99 years old. Isn't that awesome? And then, yeah. And then also, we didn't mention this, but A.W. in the back, A.W. Pacey, uh, you're going to notice that there are four generations worshiping with him this morning. And we praise God for that. That's what it's about, right? So we, wanna, we don't want to just uh, praise God ourselves. We want to teach our children and pass these things on. And that's why we're thankful for the examples of, God, of uh, men uh, that have been the example of the love of God uh, to their families and have led in that way. And so uh, this morning, we are continuing our study through the book of Luke. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 6 uh, today. And I invite you to turn there with me. Um, if you have a Bible, you can feel free to turn in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we have pew Bibles. Uh, there should be some spread throughout our sanctuary. And if you don't have a Bible at, at home, you can feel free to take one of these with you as our gift to you. Uh, but we want everybody to have a, a copy of God's Word. Um, I invite you, like I said, to turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Uh, so if you're new to the Bible, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke. When you turn to the, to the New Testament, uh, so you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we're in the, in the third book today, in the sixth chapter. So it's Luke 6, 1 through 11. If you got it, say praise God. Praise God. There we go. All right. Luke chapter 6. That's what the Word of God has to say to us. This morning. On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Haven't you heard or read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of, of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. He even gave some to those who were with him. Then he told them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man there was there whose right hand was shriveled. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he, could heal on the, if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts and told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath 
or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. After looking around at them all, he told him, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. So this morning, as we open God's Word, I want you guys to think about this question. Is the Sabbath meant to be a blessing or a burden? Should it bring refreshment and freedom or weariness and chains? So let's pray. Uh, God, we, we pray this morning, God, as we look to your word, that your Holy, your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, would illuminate the word to us this morning, God, that you would help us to understand it, and God, that you would do great things in this place, Lord. I thank you, um, God, that I feel more free in this place today, and I thank you for those that have been praying, um, God, because we know um, that we can't change hearts, God. Uh, we can't serve you without the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, God. And we just ask that you would do great things in this place today. God, I pray that you would convict people of sin, that you draw people to yourself. God, that you would save people, that you would set people free from addiction and bondage. God, that you would do incredible things for your glory. God, that Christians would be encouraged and empowered uh, to live on mission. And God, that we wouldn't create man-made traditions that keep people from coming to you. That we wouldn't pour burdens on, on people when, when you mean to bring freedom. God, that we wouldn't add to your word extra things for people to do. Or God, that we wouldn't try um, to earn our own righteousness by doing extra things, God, but that we would rest in the finished work of Christ this morning. God, I thank you again for all the godly dads, Lord, and, and those today uh, um, that miss their dad. Like, I, I miss my dad today, Lord, um, but I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful for the impact he had on me. I'm thankful to be a father and for all those men uh, today that have stepped in and those that have uh, filled the role where, where others, where there was a gap, Lord. Um, and I pray today, God, that as we, as we look to those men, as we think about those men, God, that we would give you praise and glory. And we thank you for being the perfect heavenly father, even when maybe our dads fell short. And we know that, that we all fall short. But God, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I heard this uh, story, I actually heard this story uh, from another pastor, and I was like, dude, there's no way that this is true. And so I decided, um, I, was, I heard this story, and I was like, man, I'm going to look this up myself. And this happened on April 26th of 1992, and there's actually a Los Angeles Times article on what happened. And it says, world, world in brief, Israel, apartments burn in Sabbath delay. And so I'm just going to read you the short paragraph of exactly what happened. Tenants let three apartments in the predominantly ultra-Orthodox Tel Aviv suburb burn while they asked a rabbi whether a call to the fire department on the Sabbath would violate Jewish tenants. Observant Jews are forbidden to use telephones on the Sabbath because to do so would involve breaking an electric current, which is considered a form of work. They are, however, permitted to break the Sabbath in a case of an emergency. In the half hour it took the rabbi to say yes, the fire spread onto two neighboring apartments. And no one was hurt in the place, but they burned to the ground. So literally, there's a fire in these apartments. And these Jewish men are standing there seeing the fire and like, oh man, I don't know if we can call the fire department. Because that would be work. And they let it burn to the ground. How insane is that when you think about that? Not what God means for the Sabbath when he, when he talks about the Sabbath. And so, so what does that mean? And, and what we see here um, in Luke 6, as we look at Luke 6, 1 through 3, that religious people can be guilty of substituting God's word for their traditions. Religious people. And I'm guilty of this when I'm talking about religious people. Sometimes I can be a religious person that I have my preferences and sometimes I want to place them over God's word and say, oh man, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. Uh, in reality, we need to look to the word of God. What does God's word say about it? It's what he says, not what we say. And we should be very, I mean, if God's word says it, we need to do it. We need to be obedient to it. God's very serious about doing things the way they want it. But when we add on these extra things that are not commanded in God's word, 
We can come, become very religious and substitute our preferences over what God's Word has to say. And so Luke 6, 1 through 3. On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were hungry with him, who were with him, did when he was hungry? And so Jesus' disciples are heading through some grain fields. They're hungry. They need something to eat. They haven't had anything to eat, so what do they do? They pick some heads of grain, and they rub them in their hands, and they eat them. So they pick the grain off, they rub it to get the kernels off the husks, so they can eat them. I mean, the process makes sense. You're hungry, get something to eat. And so you look at this text, and you're like, well, are they stealing? Did they do something wrong? Like, why, why are they uh, acting like this? But then we look in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 23, verses 24 and 25. And we realize it's not considered stealing. It's, it's normal practice to do this. It says, if you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want, but do not pick any in your, do not put any in your basket. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. And so they're doing what's, what's lawful. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. They're hungry. Um, they're providing them something to eat. And so what's the problem here? Well, the problem is it's on the Sabbath. Well, what is the Sabbath? When we look back in Exodus chapter 20, and I'll just read verses 8 through 11. Um, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. Your son, you, your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. And, and so what do we see here in this text? You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. That's what we see. It's supposed to be a day of rest. And so... Uh, Sabbath literally means rest. Um, if you look at it, um, the entire meaning, cessation, ceasing from work, that you're taking a time of rest. And so on the seventh day, which was Saturday uh, for the Jews, they're getting a break from work. It's a holy day for the Lord. Uh, we remember what God has done in creation. It's a time to refresh and to refuel and to focus on God. And it took place from Friday evening um, until Saturday evening. And this seems like a great thing. Hey, you don't have to go to work. You get to take a rest. You, you think about all that God has done. This is meant to be a blessing, not a burden. And to remember that they are different because they belong to God. They're God's people. Remember what God has done. And so this is a time to refresh and, and to think about how good God is. And so it seems like an incredible thing for the Jewish people that they get this blessing. It's a gift. It's a reminder that God is in complete control, that we trust Him. And I would say even in our culture today, we need to take time to slow down and to rest. Uh, some people, you know, love to work, and, and work is a, is a great thing. I would say the Bible commands us to work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone is unwilling to work, he should not eat. And so they're saying, man, we, we need to work hard. We need to do our best. Um, it's important for us to, to work and to provide. And to do what is good. And I think we reflect God when we do our best. And, and we work as unto the Lord. right? We do it for Him. But we need to take time to rest and to recharge. We need to trust the Lord and worship Him. Sometimes it's good just to take a break and say, Man, I, I need to remember that I'm not the one in control. I'm not the one that, that's keeping us in orbit. I'm not the one that's sustaining myself. God is my provider. God is holy. God is good. We need to take time to remember all the things that he has done. And so we need to trust the Lord um, and worship him. However, you know, when I read that text, did it say anything in Exodus when it talked about ceasing from work? Did it say you can't pick grain and, and eat it from the field? No, it didn't say that in that text. And so they're adding to the law. The Jews took the Sabbath very seriously. They're given the Sabbath law at Sinai. 
And there were some rabbis that even taught that the Messiah wouldn't be able to come until the Israelites perfected the Sabbath. And so all these extra things. And they soon started to to worship on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. And the problem was that the Sabbath was meant to be a blessing and a time of refreshment, but the religious leaders made it a burden by substituting and adding their religious traditions and interpretations with so many requirements that no one could keep it. Nobody could. And that's why Jesus said, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And so find rest in Christ. And he's saying that amongst the people that are just completely worn out from trying to do all these extra things and trying to keep all these extra things. And he's saying, no, this, I'm not a burden to you. I'm a blessing. There's refreshment in Christ. How many of you guys loved to recess as a kid? Anybody? I know I did. Like, that was my favorite part of the school day. Recess and lunch. I think I've said that before. I see the hand way up and back. I'm with you. Um, loved recess. But one of the most frustrating things, and I was guilty of this, is before recess sometimes, uh, somebody would talk when we weren't supposed to be talking. And everybody in the class would just look at them. They'd just stare them down because the teacher would write their name on the board and say, 10 minutes off. And they'd be like, Gah! what are you doing? Stop. And, and then sometimes I was guilty of that. And, like, and sometimes it would just be the person that would get punished. But then it would be the whole class. And then, and then pretty soon, this time that was meant to be refreshing and fun, it's like, dude, you took away all our fun time because you couldn't keep your mouth shut. And uh, the Pharisees took away all the rest and the blessing because they couldn't keep their man-made traditions, couldn't keep their mouths shut. They're adding all these extra things. And so these rabbis are interpreting these things and adding these things. And you may think, and even me as I was looking at it this week, I'm like, okay, I think I have a pretty good idea of this. But it's pretty crazy when you start looking at what they actually did, what they actually added to the Sabbath. And so according to the tradition of the rabbis, by picking the heads of grain, they were harvesting. By rubbing their, their, them together, they were threshing. And they considered this work on the Sabbath. Did God's command say that? I, I, we already said no, it, it didn't. They invented this interpretation and they forced it on other people. Intentionally violating the Sabbath was punishable by death. This is a serious thing. It went a lot further than, than harvesting grain. And so let me give you some examples of things that you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath. And this is, I actually looked this up on the Orthodox Union. It's one of the largest Orthodox Jewish organizations in the United States. And so some of these are for today and then some of these are uh, from previously. So they provide 39 categories of Sabbath work that is pro- prohibited along with some different examples. So you have the Talmud and the Talmud is the ba- Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible describes the Talmud in this way. Uh, it's a word meaning to study, to learn. And it's a body of literature in Hebrew and Aramaic covering interpretations of legal portions of the Old Testament, uh, progressive establishment of tradition materials in addition of a body of wise counsel counsel for many rabbinical sources spanning a time period from shortly after Ezra, about 400 B.C., until approximately the 8500. So it's all these rabbis that have come together and said, this is how you need to interpret the law, and this is what you need to do, and this is what it means to keep the Sabbath and, and to do what it says. And so it's their teaching and what they believe the Old Testament is saying and how it should be interpreted and so the, is the Talmud scripture? You guys can answer that. Is it scripture? No. It's their teaching. It's their interpretation of the rules. And so they have 24 chapters teaching on how to handle the Sabbath. John MacArthur pointed this out. The words of the scribes that, that it actually says, it's actually a quote uh, from some uh, rabbis that the words of the scribes are more lovely than the words of the law. It's a greater crime to transgress the words of the school of the Rabbi Hillel than the words of the Scripture. My son, attend to the words of the scribes more than the words of the law. So they're saying, hey, you need to elevate the words of the rabbi above the Word of God, which is wrong. But that's what they did. And so here's some examples. You can't extinguish on the Sabbath. Uh, When I say you can't extinguish, that means you can't turn down a flame in any way. 
So you can't turn, on, turn down the gas on the Sabbath. Uh, you can't turn off any lights or electrical appliances on the Sabbath because that's creating fire. That's, that's work. Writing. This includes all forms of writing and drawing, typing, printing, using a rubber, a rubber stamp, all come under this heading. And the main objective of writing is the keeping of records. And therefore, the spirit of the law forbids any activity normally requiring a written record. Thus, the Sanhedrin forbade all sorts of business activity as well as marriage and divorce on the Sabbath. Cooking. This includes all forms of cooking and baking. Even boiling water falls under this category. It, inform, it includes any form of heat treatment of non-foods. Thus, melting wax, or melting, melting metal or wax and firing c- ceramics are all included. You can't do that on the Sabbath because that's too much work. An automobile engine works by burning gasoline. So turning the ignition on your car is work. Can't do that on the Sabbath. Uh, you better not do that. Don't be caught doing that. It's forbidden to drive a car on the Sabbath. Heating a piece of metal so that it glows is also in this category of burning. I guess we can't light fireworks on the Sabbath too. I didn't think about that. But you can't do that. Um, and so when an electric light is turned on, it's filament, it's heated, white hot, producing light. This is therefore forbidden. No washing of garments. You better not do any laundry on the Sabbath. That's work. And so you can't do that either. Washing or bleaching a garment in any manner. It, it also re- includes removing any spot or stain from clothing. Wringing out a wet garment also funds it. So if you get a garment wet, you can't uh, wring out a cloth on the Sabbath. You better not do that. Walking. You can't walk more than 3,000 feet on the Sabbath. And so, um, especially in this time period that we're talking about, you better be very careful because if you walk more than 3,000 feet, you're going to be in trouble because you've broken the law. Now, now you have transgressed. And so... All these things, you think about, I mean, you can't spit on the ground on the Sabbath. Because if you spit on the ground, that could create, that's mud, and and it could create mud. And mud is used to to create bricks. And so if you did that, that's a form of work. And so they're just heaping these things on the people to where they're just to the point. They're like, this is absolutely miserable. And they took God's blessing and made it into a burden for the people. And so these religious leaders are substituting their outward show for God's commands. And they took what God intended to be refreshment, a joy, and they made it into human works and tried to justify themselves by keeping all these things. And so I'd ask you today, and we look at that and we might say, man, they're so horrible. They're so bad. But I'd ask you today, Are you guilty of putting religious traditions on people that Scripture does not require? And if I'm really honest today, I have to say I am guilty. That I sometimes put religious traditions on people. Hold people to standards that Scripture does not. And I just confess that. And I think we can stand in the way sometimes of people coming and finding refreshment in Christ because we've created religious traditions that the Bible does not command things that we have added to. I mean, you you think about all the ways, and I was talking with my wife about this too. I mean, many have been turned away from churches because they didn't have the proper clothes. Scripture doesn't command that. They didn't know the religious lingo. They didn't smell the right way, and so they weren't accepted. They didn't pray with their head bowed and their eyes closed. That's not commanded uh, for us to do that. They didn't listen to the right type of music. I mean, you think about all the ways that we can become very religious. Say, man, did you raise your hands in worship? Did you not raise your hands? Did you clap when you were supposed to? Did you sit down when you weren't supposed to? Did you stand up when you weren't supposed to? Did you come and and bow at the altar? Did you do this or do this? And we add all these extra things that are not required. And so, did you serve in every single ministry of the church? And a lot of times what we're saying is, do you do, you do what I do? Because until you do what I do, then, then I'm not going to accept you. You're not doing it the right way because it's not the way that I do it. But what does Scripture teach? Jesus brings refreshment. Now, and I'm not saying not to serve. We need to serve in ministry. We need to use our gifts. I mean, we talk about that at the beginning, and God's given each of us gifts. Some of that's different ministries. I might not have the, the same passions and giftings, or, or I know that I don't, um, that... Um, others do in our church. I may not have the same, the same talents. I mean, you heard the worship. You don't want me to sing on stage. It's going to be awful. 
Like if I start singing on stage, no one's going to come to our church again. It's going to close down one Sunday. That'll be it. And so don't, we don't want that to happen. But we don't want to be like the Pharisees that add religious traditions on top of Scripture. We, we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that says we're, we're, we're saved by grace through faith in Him, that, that it's not based on us. It's when we return from our sin, when we repent and, and put our trust in Him for salvation, that Jesus is our rest. And so we should not elevate religious ceremonies over showing mercy and compassion to people. Look at Luke 6, 3-5. through 5. Jesus answered them, Haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. He even gave some of those, he even gave some to those who were with him. Then he told them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so if you look back at this story uh, with David, you can see this in 1 Samuel. 21. And so in the holy place, there was showbread, which was uh, comprised of 12 loaves, and it represented the 12 tribes of Israel, and it stood on this table. And it was a reminder of God's provision for His people. And each Sabbath, it was replaced with fresh bread. And so they took the old bread that had been there that was becoming more kind of like a cracker. It's taken off, replaced with fresh bread, and the only ones that could eat it were the priests. Because this uh, bread was consecrated to the Lord. And so in, for, in 1 Samuel 21, we see that David is on the run from Saul with his men. They're hungry. Uh, David meets Amalek, Amalek, I'm sorry, the priest, and asks him to give him the loaves of bread or whatever can be found. He explains that, uh, Amalek explains that um, the only bread that's available is the bread of the presence. Find out these men had not defiled themselves that were with David by being with women, and he gave him the consecrated bread. And that's showing us something there, that God cares about the needs of His people. We don't see any uh, command where they're like, oh, you should not have done that. That these men were hungry and God provided for them in a way that was above religious tradition and ceremony. And so Jesus, when He's talking to the Pharisees, He's like, hey, uh, you got all this religious uh, tradition. Have you not read... God's word? Do you not remember what God did? That he provided in this way? Mercy and compassion are more important than God loves people. He cares about their needs. You're forcing all these extra commands on them. These people are hungry and they need to eat. Uh, we learn in this account in, Ma in Mark 2, 27, that he also says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In Matthew 12, 7, it says, If you had known what this means, I deserve, desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. God loves people. God loves people so much that it goes far beyond religious tradition and ceremony, that God is concerned with the needs of people. And we need to be careful that we have that same type of compassion and love towards people. And that we don't create things that God has not created. Extra rules. And the fact is that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. What is he saying when he's saying that? The Son of Man is over the Sabbath. He is the creator and sustainer. And he interprets it, not them. He is the Messiah. He equated himself with Jehovah God. That their religious traditions will not save them. They need to rest in the Messiah. Jesus has the final say, not the religious leaders. He's before them. He knows all things. He controls all things. And he has authority over all things. So regardless of what the religious people say, we look to the word of God, not to their opinions. And so Jesus is making it very clear for them. And so he's Lord over the Sabbath. And then we read on. On another Sabbath, so this is another Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was shriveled. And so the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would not heal on the Sabbath. So this guy's hand is basically not usable here, right? He's in need of healing. And you think about how 
sick and twisted this is. That rather than having concern for the man, they're standing around waiting to see if Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath to bring a charge against him. So they don't have any compassion on the guy. They just want to exert their religious authority to call Christ out. And the scribes and the Pharisees are watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts and told the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? To save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, all. Oh, he told him, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. And so you think about this. Is it better to do good on the Sabbath or, or to do evil? Is it better to save life or to destroy it? He stretches out his hand and he heals the man. And you think about this. Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath. That's why he's there. But he stops to have compassion on the man, to heal him. And that really shows us something about our God, that He takes time for people. He loves people. God has compassion on the broken and the hurting and those that are, have just been burdened with so many rules that they can't keep. He has compassion on us that, that can't keep the law. That each one of us here today says, man, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep God's commands. I, I've sinned. I've fallen short. And yet our God has compassion on us. How merciful should we be if we are in Christ? How compassionate should we be if we've been forgiven of our sins? If we've experienced the mercy of God, although we did not deserve it, how much more merciful should we be than anybody on the planet? And so we should seek to go to those and say, man, there's rest in Jesus Christ. You haven't experienced life until you've experienced Jesus. You haven't experienced freedom until you've trusted in Jesus. You haven't experienced healing until you've been healed of Jesus. You haven't experienced hope until you've experienced the hope of Jesus Christ that will not disappoint. There's salvation under no other name than the name of Jesus. And so it's good news for those. And this should be a time to rejoice. This should be a time to celebrate, to praise God for what He's done, that He's healed this man in a miraculous way. Shouldn't the Pharisees take time to rejoice? We think about what it says in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Those things you should have done without neglecting the others. And so they don't understand mercy and compassion. They're all about law with no grace. And God's law is meant to point us to His grace that we find in Christ, right? That we say, man, we, we can't keep this. God is holy. He's perfect. The law is good. But the law reveals our need for a Savior. And so God offers mercy and compassion to people that trust in Him. And true Sabbath rest is found in Jesus Christ. And so if you need true rest for your souls, it's found in in Him. Think about what the book of, of Hebrews says. Hebrews 4.3 For we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what He has said. So I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest even though His works have been finished since the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4.3 And then it goes on to say in Hebrews 9.11 Therefore a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works. And that's really what the Sabbath is pointing us to. Is that our works will not save us. It's the work of Christ. It's his finished work. And so we rest in him. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. Second Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, Therefore don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are all a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. He is our true rest. And so you see that all of Scripture is pointing us forward to Jesus. It's pointing us to Him. It's pointing us to what He will do. And so 
you think now, like, typically churches don't worship on Saturday, but on Sunday. Why is that? Why do we worship on Sunday? Because Christ rose from the dead. And so we celebrate His resurrection. And so we rest in His finished work for our salvation. We don't practice the same type of Sabbath. We find our Sabbath in resting from our works and putting our faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. And so we do worship, but we worship in a whole new way. We worship as those who say the work has been done, that Jesus is enough. If you've trusted in Him, you've found rest. And if you're weary today, find rest in Christ and what He has done. And so today, church, on Father's Day, we have a reason to celebrate that our God has redeemed us. He's restored us. And the reason that we're able to have godly men that stand in the gaps for their families is because of what Christ has done and the example that we have of a godly, heavenly Father that loves us and invites us to rest. I don't know about you, but in a society where we are completely worn out at times, that just says, go, 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 go. You got to get ahead. You got to do this. You got to do that. It's good to know that, it's, that there's a time where we can rest because the work has been finished. Our salvation is complete. And if you're trusting in any other work today to save you, if you're trusting in your own morality, if you're trusting in um, your religious ceremonies, your traditions, if you're trusting in your church attendance, if you're trusting in your generosity, if you're trusting in the fact that you believe in God and try not to cuss, today I want to tell you, Hope is not found in your morality. Hope is found in Jesus Christ alone and what he has done for us. And so today, rest from your work. Turn from from trying to earn it on your own and turn to Jesus. And I invite us as well um, to not keep other people from coming to Christ because of our religious traditions, because of our ceremonies, because of our extra requirements, to preach the gospel and to welcome those who would come to faith in Christ. That God welcomes all those who would repent and turn. It doesn't matter uh, your skin color. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter if you've been the most moral or the, or the least moral, that we all find mercy and grace through the cross of Christ. Praise God. It's good news today. And I would encourage you today, if you've never trusted in Jesus, to make this the day where you say, man, I... I need need Christ. I need that rest. I need that forgiveness. I I need need you to save me. And I encourage you to come to Christ and find, find rest, find mercy, find compassion in a God that loves you. And he loves you so much that the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God meets you where you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there. He's got great things uh, when we come to him by grace through Christ. I'm going to pray and If the worship team, if you guys would just wait just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'll invite the worship team up. All right, let's pray. God, I thank you so much, um, Lord, for being a God that is compassionate, that offers rest uh, for our souls, God. Lord, that, that you have worked, you have done great things, not only in creation, God, but through the cross and through the empty tomb. And I thank you today that all of us who are sinners find life and hope in Jesus Christ. I thank you today that it's not based on our good deeds or, or our strong work ethic or, or our morality, Lord, that it doesn't matter if we've fallen down a thousand times, God, that you offer hope and forgiveness uh, through the cross. And, Lord, that you have a strong grip on those who trust in you. And I pray that today, Lord, that as we celebrate our dads, we would take time to celebrate what you have done. And, Lord, I pray this morning that if there are any here that have never trusted in Jesus, that, that as we sing, that they would come, that they would find hope in you, And I pray for those around us, Lord, that maybe have been burdened with so many rules. That have been put under so much shame, sometimes by well-meaning religious people, Lord. Sometimes by us. God, help us to have your type of compassion and your love for people. And to welcome them, to love them, and to invite them into relationship with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, I'm going to invite our our worship team to come now. And during this time, as we sing, 
I want to invite you just to, to worship Jesus where you're at, um, to take time to really think about what he's done for you, and, and to think about where you are in your relationship with Christ. Have you trusted in him? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Is he your rest today? And if you haven't trusted in him, then I invite you at this time to come, come to the altar. Um, I'll be here to pray. Uh, my wife will be here and some others on our prayer team will be here. Um, just for prayer, whatever, whatever that looks like. If you need to, if you want to know more about what it means to, to have a relationship with Christ, to come during this time, if you need to pray for somebody, whatever's on your heart today, uh, let's be open and receptive to him and, and know that we have a God that offers rest. I invite you guys to stand. And I'll have
invite you guys just to be seated for a moment. Let's move into a time of offering. I'll invite the ushers to come forward. Ethan. Amen. Aren't you thankful that he is a good father? Uh, we have a reason to rejoice today. Um, just let you know a couple things before I, I pray for our, our tithes and our offerings. Um, deacon nomination, just you see it listed um, in your bulletin. This is the last day that we're taking those up. Um, so you can drop those in the foyer in the Connection Center. There's boxes in both places. If you have somebody on your heart uh, that you feel like um, would be a good fit to serve in the deacon ministry that meets the qualifications, uh, please pray about that and please drop that in there today. Um, other things, uh, a number of other things that are, that are coming up that you can see. Our baby bottles, if you've not done so, uh, the bottles that were taken up for Choices Life uh, Resource Center. Uh, you can bring those to our Connection Center. There's a bag out there today. I encourage everybody to fill those up. If you didn't grab one, we still have a few more. Fill those up with change, checks, cash. It goes to an incredible ministry that is helping uh, women and families um, with the resources they need uh, with their pregnancy and just sharing the hope of Christ at the same time. So I encourage you with that. Uh, this past week, Sunday uh, through Wednesday, I was able to go up, as Nathaniel and Caitlin were as well, um, to our Southern Baptist Convention. And I just wanted to encourage you guys. I'll just say one thing about it. Uh, one, stay off social media if you want to find out stuff about the SBC because people just say crazy stuff that's not always accurate at all. Uh, but I was very, very encouraged. And, and Jimmy and Catherine as well, I'm sorry. Jimmy and Catherine were there as well. Um, very, very encouraged to get together with, I think it was close to 14,000 14, people that were there um, with the SBC. One of the coolest things um, that we saw, I'll just tell you two things, uh, just because I think it relates to our mission as a church. Uh, that I got to worship in a room with Burmese pastors. We got invited in, me and my buddy, uh, we were uh, looking in at what they were doing. We got to worship with a, a group of Burmese pastors that are planting churches through the SBC all throughout the U.S. and, and doing ministry and reaching people for the gospel. It was incredible to hear Je Jesus worshiped in another language and to see what God is doing through our giving because that comes from every SBC church that as we give, we give a portion to the cooperative program that funds missions and missionaries all over the world, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide. And then also, uh, we were able to commission 83 new full-time missionaries through the International Mission Board. Praise God for that. Amen? And, and that, that happens, and I just want to say you got, tell you guys thank you for that, uh, because that's what it's about. It's about the mission of Jesus. We want to see the gospel taken to the nations. We want to see the disciples made uh, from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Right to the glory of God. And so um, as we give, just, just remember those things and encourage us to give back uh, to God as an act of worship during this time and to praise God for what, what he's doing. Um, and let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for being a God that is so good to us, Lord. And we know that, just like the book of James says, that, that everything, every good and perfect gift comes down from you, Lord. And, and we just praise you for that. We praise you for your provision in our lives. God, help us to have loose hands, God, on the things that you've given us, Lord, that they're for you, Lord, that they belong to you. And I pray now as we give back um, as an act of worship, whether, God, we give uh, here in, in the room, God, or, or online, or, or however we give, God, that we use our finances um, and all that we have, God, that we give back to you first and that we trust you in that. And we ask that you multiply these gifts, Lord. We ask that you'd help us to be good stewards so that uh, people throughout Charlestown, God, uh, throughout Indiana, uh, throughout our nation, and throughout the world can hear the good news of Jesus, Lord, and that we can be faithful with all that you've given us, Lord. Uh, we thank you for each person here. Lord, help us uh, uh, to give to you, Lord, as an act of worship, and that we would see it as that, and Lord, that you would do great things. And we give you praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you pray with me, please? Precious Lord, you are our good, good Father, a bestower of many gifts and blessings, a provider of faithful presence, and we thank you, Lord. We praise you and thank you for the opportunity to be here today, to worship in this house with one another. We thank you for your presence here, and we pray, Father, for each Father who is here, each dad who is here, we pray a special blessing over them, over their families, Lord. Um, we pray for those who in the future will be fathers, Lord, that you burden their hearts to be um, men of courage and leaders who desire to lead well according to your word, lead their families well, lead in their churches, wherever that may be but we praise you and ask you, Lord, to go with us now. Help, help us to be carriers of your word into this world for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.